For the last two weeks, we've been talking about facing adversity, adverse circumstances, adverse situations, adverse people. But I think the most difficult thing to face is personal failure. To get up, to keep going, to get restored with God and people when you know you blew it in your marriage or you blew it in this job and you lost your job. Maybe your perspective right now is you've blown it as a parent. Overcoming personal failure, facing it, being restored, that's today. Don't go away. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. Living on the Edge features the Bible teaching of Chip Ingram on this daily discipleship program. I'm Dave Drury, and in this program, Chip continues his series, Keep Pressing Ahead, by bringing hope to anyone who's experiencing the agony of personal failure. You know, over the past several programs, we've talked about discouragement, opposition, and tough times. But few things in life are as devastating as personal failure. As Chip's going to remind us, though, with God, failure's never final. So no matter where you are, you can start the journey back to wholeness and restoration today. Now, after the teaching, Chip's going to give us a couple of very practical next steps, so be sure to stay with us for that. Okay, if you have a Bible handy, open it now to Nehemiah chapter 8. Now, let's join Chip for part one of his message, Facing Personal Failure. I want to talk to you about um, the adversity that comes through personal failure. The emotional pain, the spiritual pain, the relational pain, the distance from God, the guilt, the shame. When you know what's right to do and you don't do it. When God speaks very clearly and says, this is something you shouldn't do and you do it anyway. When you're in that journey and we're all, you know, some of the greatest people in scripture have made devastating steps of personal failure. And no one's immune. In many ways, the, the journey of walking with God is three step forwards in grace and then a couple step backwards. And the way it often happens with you and with me is we're just normal, regular people and every single day I'm gonna have a thought, a motive, at times an action and, and I sin. God speaks to me and says, do this, Chip, and you know, no. And, and, and when you sin or when I sin, and whether it's an internal motive or, or whether it's something I look at or something that I say or an action that I do, the Spirit of God will convict you. And, and you'll, be, you'll have this experience. You'll lose this sense of peace and connection with God. And the whole goal of that connection, broken, is to let you know something's wrong. The Spirit acts as an empire, an arbitrator in your heart. And so the moment you get that, I'm praying nine out of 10 days, that light goes on inside you, oh Lord, I'm sorry. And you claim that promise if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sin, cleanse you from all unrighteousness, fellowship is broken, God still loves you, and then you kind of get back on track. And that's how it goes for most of us, you know, uh, hopefully most of the time. But I'd like you to lean back for just a minute because I want to talk about how sometimes you end up in really bad spots. And if you don't understand how it happens, you'll get so used to it, you won't even understand why you're going through what you're going through. Sometimes personal failures aren't so small, they're not so temporary, and we're not so quick to respond. The spirit convicts and we just push it away. We pull away. We drift. We harden our heart. Those occasional sins begin to become patterns. Relationships deteriorate. Guilt increases. Denial sets in. You start rationalizing what you're doing and why you're doing it. You blame other people. You find yourself unconsciously sort of staying away from people and places that bring truth into your life. You begin to live a lie of secrets and lies. Your conscience, like mine, little by little becomes dull. And, and things that so clearly violate God's word, they don't register hardly at all in your soul. It's just a, a tiny, little, dim uncomfortableness, 
and then intellectually you rationalize it and I rationalize it where we just decide that's okay for now. And we actually intellectually think we're, we're okay with God and yet we feel that emotional distance from him and if the truth are known, our behavior and actions are going this way and the truth and God's will are going that way. And then God does something because he loves you. David calls it the heavy hand of God upon his life. See, when you really love people, you can't let them go their own way. And so God brings what I call the velvet vice of discipline and love into your life. And he is watching you and he watches me go into these sort of times of denial and these hardening of hearts. And then he'll, uh, he'll, he'll bring some financial pressure. Mm, that didn't get your attention. It might bring some health issues. Might bring a conflict in your marriage. Might allow something to happen in the economy. He might give you a biopsy report that really gets your attention, either yours or someone that you love. He might have one of your kids go through something. But I will tell you, he will bring pain and increasing levels of heat and adversity to get your attention. And then when he gets your attention and you start thinking, I wonder if God is trying to speak to me through all these things, then he'll bring truth into your life. And depending on how long you let this go, you'll have one of these what I call vivid reality moments. And you'll just see yourself in light of who God is and his truth, and you'll feel the sense of shame and guilt, and I've blown it, and all the denial goes away, and you realize I have failed God, I've betrayed Christ, I have hurt people, and then this, this overwhelming kind of sense of I've ruined this, I've ruined that, I've hurt them. Can God really forgive me? And depending on how long, we can get where we're feeling like I, I, don't, think, I don't think I'm eligible anymore and I don't know how to come back to God. For most of us, we try to then work our way and do some good things and appease some things and then the patterns that are ingrained, they just keep squeezing us and squeezing us. One of the greatest men in all of Scripture was David, and he sinned. He was at the wrong place at the wrong time, and in an impulsive moment, he had an affair. And then to cover his affair and his adultery, he had a man killed. And in one of the most intimate recollections ever recorded in Scripture, he shares about somewhere between a 12 to 14 month period when he was keeping this under wraps and he was in the velvet vice of God's grip. And he shares what it did to his heart and what it did to his body and what it did to his emotions. And you can follow along if you'd like to at the put them on the front of your notes. I read in Psalm 32 where David is talking about the personal pain that's come from his failure. And he said, when I kept silent, talking about his sin with Bathsheba, talking about murder, talking about the violation of his conscience. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. The adversity that God will bring sometimes will be very physical. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. God loves you, he won't leave you alone. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. He's talking about feeling depressed, no energy. I can't go on. He doesn't like himself. Then verse five, we get a turning point, and it's the turning point God brought some of you in this room today to break out of this because he loves you. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and notice what happened, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And so in a moment of time, he realizes, I'm coming clean, I see it, I'm gonna own it, I'm gonna just get absolutely honest before you, will you forgive me, he does. And then after that pain, notice he talks about the path of restoration, and he talks not only about himself, but for you and me. He says, therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while he may be found. The inference is there's times he may not be found. There's times where you can go into such denial and have such patterns that you won't hear God's voice later. And so some of you, he brought you today 
to give you one more chance. Surely, when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. And then as he begins to experience this release, this sense of forgiveness, he says, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. He's a king and he's gonna have to face the people. He's gonna have to own his stuff. He's gonna have to admit he's committed adultery and he's a leader. And then he's gonna have to own up to murder. And he has no ideas what the consequences of God will be. And then we get in verse eight, God's response to him. And by the way, it's his response to you. Because the reason most of us don't come out of these kind of times is down deep we feel like, you know what? I don't know how to face it. I don't know what to do. The consequences are so overwhelming and I can't make it alone. And God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way in which you should go. I'll be with you. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. I'll take you through this. I'll coach you through this. You can make it. You're not the first person that's really blown it. But he makes a warning. He says, don't be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding but must be controlled by a bit or bridle or they won't come. Don't, don't, don't make me keep yanking on your life. It could get worse. He says, because many are the woes of the wicked but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man, the woman that trusts in him. What God brought you into this room on this day to grasp at maybe a level that you never have, is despite anything you've done secretly or in your mind or in your heart or in your behavior or what someone may never ever know, he still loves you. His unfailing, steadfast, loyal, forgiving love. But the issue a lot in my life in the past has been how do you experience that when you know you've messed up? How do you get out of projecting and protecting and how do you get where you experience what David experienced, new life, a fresh start. Turn in your notes, if you will, because Nehemiah, in this last section, is gonna be our model. He's gonna show us exactly how to be restored, and he's gonna say in this passage, chapter eight, there's three conditions. He's gonna say it's gonna start with a return to God's word, then he's gonna tell us we have to respond to that truth, and then he's gonna say when you return to his word, respond to the truth from the heart, he says you're gonna have to apply it to your life, and when you do, you can be clean. And when you do, he'll walk with you. And when you do, he can take some of the worst times of your life and turn them around. And chapter eight opens, when the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. Then notice who takes the initiative. They told Ezra, remember he's the priest, he's the teacher of the law. The scribe, bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So, on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. So, so children that were old enough to understand as someone would read and explain something what was going on. He read it out loud from daybreak until noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, the women, and the others who could understand. And all the people listened intently to the book of the law. And then they want you to get this picture. There's about 30 to 50,000 people, roughly, And they've built this large platform because now the people that the walls are built, the gates are there, there's some alignment. It's okay, we need to fulfill God's mission. And so there's this large platform and Nehemiah is going to be on it. And I'll I'll do my best to read the names that are very hard to pronounce for me of about 13 priests. And from dawn till noon, he's going to read out loud the Pentateuch or the first five books, the Law of Moses. And so imagine 30 to 50,000 people out there and we pick it up, Ezra opened the book and all the people could see him because he was standing above them and he opened it and the people stood up. And it was on this wooden platform and to his right were Mathaliah and Shema and Ananijah and Uriah and Hilkiah and Maaseah and on his left were Padiah and Mishael and Majika and Hashum and Hashabadad, and Zechariah, and Meshalom. 
And all the people could see him because he was standing above them and he opened it and they stood up and Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and they responded, amen, amen, as they heard the word of God being taught. And then they bowed down and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then the Levites, so we have up here 13 on the platform with him and then I'm not going to attempt to read the next 13 names. They're even harder to pronounce. But the Levites are the people that instruct people. They're the people that help with the temple. And if you list them, what you'll find is there's 13 key Levite leaders. And then notice what they do. They instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God. Here's the key line. Making it clear. Literally, the Hebrew word means to separate. It it means to break down. It has the idea of translating, of giving the understanding, the meaning, so that the people could understand what was being read. So I I put some notes together. If you have a pen, follow along. Let's just look at, so so what did they do? First and foremost, they returned to the word. So, So what did they actually do? They took initiative. They took the initiative. They said, Ezra, you've been here. Historically, he's been there about 14 years. And he's had Bible studies and he's been teaching, but the enemies have been bad and the walls haven't been rebuilt. The temple's going kind of slow. And so Ezra's been teaching, but there's been no momentum. There's been no traction. There's been no we are the people of God. And after 14 years and things are aligned, they take the initiative and they say, Ezra, the book of the law, would you read it to us? We want to know God's plan. So he does. Notice the second they invested time. I mean, I don't know about you, but when's the last time you spent six straight hours standing up in reverence to hear God's word? From dawn until noon. Third, they listened attentively. I mean, they, this wasn't like, okay, we're supposed to do this, you know, a couple chapters a day or a few hours a day, keep the devil away, you know. This, this is like, we want to hear what is God's plan? What does he say? So that's what they did. Now notice how they did it. They came before God in families, men, women, and those who could understand. These parents understood that it's not enough to tell your kids what you learned somewhere else, but when they get old enough to understand that what's going on, they wanted them to see Nehemiah. They wanted him to see the people. They wanted him to see God's word read and heard. They wanted to be around when the Levites came, because you get this idea that it was taught publicly And then there must have been some breaks where the Levites and the priests would go into the crowd and begin to explain it to them. This is what it means. This is how it goes. And so they read the word publicly. At some point in time, they just wanted to know, what did God say? Then they explained the word privately. What does it mean? I mean, can you imagine... They worshiped idols, they turned away from God, the heavy hand of God was upon the nation. It was his discipline. Hebrews 12 says, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet those who've been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. The Proverbs and Hebrews 12 both teach that when we sin, the discipline, the velvet vice of God, he brings consequences into our life to get our attention, to draw us back to him. And so the consequences were 70 years they went into captivity. And then another 100 years they're kind of working their way back. And so these are people that that don't, they've never heard. And they're hearing stories about the Exodus. And they're hearing stories from Deuteronomy 6 about love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. Fathers, teach your children to walk when you rise up and when you lie down. And they would read numbers and they'd read the laws in Leviticus and for six hours they're hearing things many of them have never heard. And then in these smaller kind of subgroups, they're getting explained. This is what it means. Then finally, they worship God reverently. Came across a verse that is uh, in Isaiah 66 that is very, very powerful. And it's written at a time when people were far from God. And God says, this is the one that I esteem. These are the people that find favor in his eyes. Those who have a humble and contrite heart, and who tremble at my word. 
who tremble at my word, who understand the God that spoke into nothingness and the galaxies came into existence is the same God who sent the second person of the Trinity, his son, to be the living word and to walk among us and that he gave us his written word and that all scripture is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God, the woman of God, could be adequately equipped to live the kind of life that would enjoy God's love and fulfill his mission. And Jesus would say that, hey, you'll never live by physical issues and physical fulfillment, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And so when these people heard the holiness of God and his word, They raised their hands, and when they said, amen, amen, they were saying, we agree that what has been spoken is true from the high and holy God, and then it says they bowed low, and they prostrated themselves, and they humbled themselves, and were saying, we're returning our life, our dreams, our values, our children, our family, our money, we're returning under the authority of your word. And they worshiped. I would ask you as we... uh, Go to the second condition. What would it look like for you to return to God's word? I mean, I I would encourage you to just go down through the list and say, am I taking initiative? Am I investing time? Is there there a level of attentiveness? For some of you in families, I'd ask, are our families coming before God and his word corporately? Is my family coming before God's word privately in our home? Am I I pursuing the understanding of God's word? Am I in some sort of smaller group community where it's explained and I can learn it? So many of the issues that you face and I face are so far away from God's best for your life. But if you don't know what his best is because it's in his word, and you neglect it, and you disobey, you receive these consequences, and these consequences, this holy, loving God will bring the velvet vice into your life to get your attention, to bring you to a day like this, to say, stop, turn around, repent, listen, let me love you, let me restore you. Before we go on, I wanna give you a chance right now to make a decision to turn around to stop, to say to God, I want to come back to you. I I want to be forgiven. I want to be restored. And I am aware that it's not just saying this, but I need to go where you've told me to go. You told me that your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You have told me that I can't live by bread alone, but I live by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. I want you right now to confess to God, even if you can't close your eyes and and pray out loud, you can do it in your mind and your heart, and he hears, tell God that you have talked to friends, you maybe have seen a counselor, you maybe have read some books about your problems, you maybe have done all kind of things, but and not that those may be wrong. But tell God you're sorry that you haven't come to him, that you haven't got into his word. David said in the midst of his most trying times, if your word had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Now, tell the Lord, I'm coming home. I'm asking you to forgive me. And starting today, I'm going to get into your word. Uh, Let me encourage you to go to Psalm 51. It's after David's personal failure. And I want you to read before you go to bed, Psalm 51 every single night. Leave it open or put a bookmark right at Psalm 51 and read it slowly and out loud. And remember that he failed miserably and God forgave and restored and called him a man after his own heart. And then in the morning, what I want you to do, and it's only six or seven or eight minutes, I want you to open up the book of Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's the second gospel. And I want you to just read one chapter every morning for about the next two or three weeks. Mark in the morning, Psalm 51 at night, and say, Lord, strengthen me, speak to me. You will find new power and new energy in the midst of your pain. Return to his word. You've been listening to Chip's talk, Facing Personal Failure, from his series, Keep Pressing Ahead. 
Chip will be back with a final word about his message, but before he is, I hope you'll take a second to go online or tap share and encourage others to hear this message too. Adversity comes in all shapes and sizes, discouragement, opposition, tough circumstances, and personal failure. But with this series, Chip gives you the tools and the tactics you need to keep pressing ahead, no matter what. For a limited time, keep pressing ahead, resources are discounted, and the MP3s are free. Now, to order your copy or to send it to a friend, just visit us online at livingontheedge.org or give us a call at 1-888-333-6003. As we close today's program, let me just remind you that there's people in need and you can make a difference by sending them this series and just saying to them, I'm for you, I'm with you, we can make it together. I think this will really give you a shot in the arm spiritually. Let's make a difference in someone's life today. Thanks, Chip. The series is called Keep Pressing Ahead, and there are only a couple more days to take advantage of the series discounts. For complete information on CDs and free MP3s, just go to livingontheedge.org or give us a call at 1-888-333-6003. Special offers on the app will also get you there. Order for yourself or someone you know and help them get pressing ahead, too. Well, just before we close, I want to thank each of you who's making this broadcast possible through your generous giving. 100% of your gifts are going directly to the ministry to help Christians really live like Christians. Now, if you found Chip's teaching to be helpful, but you're not yet on the team, would you consider joining today? To donate, just go to livingontheedge.org, tap Donate on the app, or give us a call at 1-888-333-6003. And let me thank you in advance for whatever the Lord leads you to do. Well, next time, Chip continues his series, Keep Pressing Ahead, so I hope you'll be with us then. For now, this is Dave Drewy saying thanks for listening to this edition of Living on the Edge. <music>